But let me introduce our, our panelists. As you already know the directors. Uh, in addition, we have uh, Young Min Che, who teaches Korean film and cinema here at USC, and has in many ways, every time I'm on a panel with her, I learn something really new and unusual about Hallyu. So we're delighted that she's here. And we're also uh, very fortunate to have uh, Soo Gyung Kim from UC Santa Barbara's School of Theater and Dance theater and dance, right? Uh, who is in many ways uh, rapidly becoming a, one of the leading figures about North Korea and its more cultural aspects and has written a number of amazing books about how North Koreans perform, think about, act in ways that uh, they're told to and how they interpret. It's just some amazing work that she's done. Uh, so we're really fortunate to have these kind of people here. And I think I will sit down now, and I'm going to just start out by asking, we'll, we'll, we'll start talking about this movie itself. And I have to ask the first question, which is, the star, uh, did she do all the tricks herself? Did she learn those, or would she already know how to do all of the 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 Kyoya. Yeah, we we uh, I mean the first question was Anya and I when we we had this the three of us are basically Anya myself and Romy Hua our co-producer, and we all sat down and, and and thought do we have do we go for real actors? Uh, I mean you're probably best to talk about that bit, or yeah you go for that one. <laughs> yeah, the question was we, it's always very difficult if if your actors have to do some extreme uh, pre um, presentations or. or it's it's very you have to decide what or you take real actors who you learn and train become acrobats or you just go and try to find acrobats who you train to become an actor or at least for the part that they have to play um because it's it's um, acrobats and flying that high in the sky is not that easy we choose for the second part so just go and we did a casting for for ac um, acrobats and just we are so amazed and so lucky that we found her because without her we wouldn't have a movie she was just pops up the screen she stay on the screen she stays there she's yeah she's just the movie star yeah. and she was known in si si uh, circus but not known in not at all known in uh, in, uh, in 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 fin cinemas and we had four months to sort of train her up. So they, they basically, they, the, the two, we went to see, um, we went for the castings, Anya and I, and I, and watched them, you know, start. I mean, we've actually all got it on film as well of their very, the first time they started acting. And it was wooden, to say the least. I don't know what you think of the later ones. But, and then later, you know, we saw them and, you know, we're on set and, you know, things had changed and so they progressed. So. Yeah. We we asked her we asked her the other day you know do you want to do a another film and before I could uh, before I could forget that you know actually get the the question out she said action so she now wants to be an action movie star so if there's anyone here in uh, in Hollywood who wants her give us a shout but in in fact there are two main characters Jang Phil is also an acrobat so there we have two acrobats and all the rest are like A list actors so one of our characters is like they are all very very famous. Um, Nick was there during the shoot and they were, he told me that everybody was like, look, 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 who's there. In fact, we have like and Brad Pitt um, and Robert De Niro and uh, what was yeah. George Clooney of North Korea in the movie. Yeah, that's <laughs> Ri Yong Ho, who's the, the commander. He, he used to, he oh. was in uh, Hong Kil Dong, which you'll remember. Yeah. Everybody's, a bit, everybody's a bit upset in North Korea you know, when they saw it because they said, he's got an older, which is yeah. actually <laughs> true because, uh, but he's still, still a star. Well, what were some of the biggest, I mean, how did you come up with the idea in the first place to do an actual North Korean production movie? I mean, both of you, we'll get into how you got into North Korea in general, but working backwards from this movie, how did you come up with an idea, let's do a movie with North Koreans and let's actually make it happen? Can you tell us a little bit about that? But it was not, not, we met in 2002 at the Pyongyang Film Festival and it's not that we had an instant idea like, let's make a movie, a feature film in North Korea together with the North Koreans for them. It's, it just came all automatically grown over 10 years. We, we, this one started off, we wanted to do it all together, first a documentary, but then it, it w moved into a short film and then suddenly we were finishing a feature film. So it all went over a period of seven years, very... Yeah, it it all went smoothly just like that. It was not 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 nothing very spectacular, in fact. But we'd seen. I think we took in uh, Bend It Like Beckham uh, in two thousand four and seen how an audience react to something that was pure entertainment. And in and 
with the two other panelists. I mean, you'll hear that in North Korea film, this this film doesn't fit a North Korean film trope in the way that it is it's entertainment all the way through without really a, 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 without a message behind it. And and it was a this subtle idea message. That, yeah. So it was this idea that, you know, a girl can actually we, we both. And again, our, the partner that I'd made three documentaries with was Ron Mihua, who we were going to make our documentary with. And so the three of us, the two girls, one and I had to sort of put on a dress and it was a girl power film. The three of us decided to make. Um, and and it, it was we wanted to do something that would, you know, really create a, a stir for the North for a North Korean audience. Audience. Well, how was it? How hard was it then to do a entertainment film? Did you have to get? I mean, it can't have just been straightforward. I mean, oh, just make a movie, sure, whatever you want. It it, it started. Um it started as a very, like Anya said, it started as a short, short film. It was, the, it was a, literally an idea of a, a foreigner going and seeing a, a North Korean uh, um, circus act. The circus is massive in North Korea. It's a very important part of the whole idea of entertaining the troops, if you like. It's a sort of a place where people go. It's, we've lost the idea of the circus. Perhaps with Cirque du Soleil, it's come back. But in North Korea, certainly in Pyongyang, and most people will go, and then when people come in from the countryside, they'll be taken there to be entertained. So it has a different significance sort of significance in, in, in North Korea culture. And our first one was a very small short film starting, a, it was going to be a Western that gets involved somehow on the scene with an acrobat. And as Anya said, the story grew and grew and grew. And we wrote, the three of us, myself, Anya and Ryom, wrote a script. It was, you know, very amatorly, amatorly written. And then Ryom Mihua in Pyongyang, um, without any further sort of, with no funding, we just purely, she had a friend who was a scriptwriter. He got involved and the script started developing. So it, it, it really was a say, organic process. And we were all three of us very clear what we wanted out of it. And Anya will say, and, and I will, we wanted an audience. We, we love it where you pay your ticket. Uh, this, a film and you watch it you get entertained and you you come out of that uh, in that way and that was the same so the three of us the the main three sort of um protagonists in in the in the actually writing the story um that's that's how, where we came up with yeah what we really d we agreed from the beginning and what we didn't want to do is like we didn't do anything politics no war no violence no drugs no sex no rock and roll so just pure entertainment a romantic story boy meets girl and at the end everything will be okay so in the way that we are it's so universal that story so yeah we maybe we were our own censors in a way because it's it's it could no this happens in pyongyang but it could be also happen in i have a friend who lives in zimbabwe it could also happen in zimbabwe sure or a uh, hundred years ago in america going to the big city right or maybe today i don't know but okay so here at the beginning when you introduced the movie you said imagine you're actually north korean there's very few of us that are. I'm going to bring Sugung in in a minute to, to sort of say what, how, how she thinks the North Korean audience might have interpreted it or reacted to it. But what, what, was, what did you guys mean when you said, you're North Korean? How do you think North Koreans would view the movie, interact with the movie, respond to the movie? Other than the universal themes. And is there something particular about the way it was presented that would resonate with North Koreans or... I think what's the, there's all sorts of little bits in it. I mean, there's there's things that a North Korean audience pick up that we don't. For example, just the simple way Yongmi when she's climbing up the circus, everyone laughs as soon as she goes up the ladder, because in North Korea that's funny. She can't do it. They know how people go up a ladder in a, on a circus. We don't pick that up. Tiny little thing. The other things that are interesting is the way the Koreans have written the script is that the that we didn't write these into the pieces. We, if you like, Anya Rom and I gave the tram lines, and then the scriptwriters came in, and then also the director. Director, then he also rewrites the script slightly and what they put in was this for example you saw at the doorway where, where the guy tries to bribe his way in you know and we didn't write that that's written by them so there's all these sort of bits and pieces that to you as a western audience you think oh that's pretty banal but actually to a north korean audience are very strong the way the 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 way the steel the guy at the at the Cholomar steelworks factory says you're a girl who doesn't take no for an answer they're quite loaded you know this is this is a story of a it is a girl power film and for them for a north korea film and in fact any film there's always a strong man behind pushing and especially in north korean films and in fact the majority of western films or either the protagonist dies at the end like a thelma and louise but in this film you know this girl 
she's you know she's ballsy and you, and and in North Korean society the, the, she uses every trick of the trade. She's a, you know she's a honey. So again, do you want to do you want to point out anything that you saw like knowing North Korean? Oh, I wouldn't venture to say that I know anything about North Korea. Speculation is a dangerous thing, but a um, couple of things that I personally saw was really interesting as somebody who has seen extensive amount of North Korean film is that the soundscape of the film is really interesting. I mean, that's the first thing that really entered my mind. It really does not sound like North Korean film. Um, the, the beautiful um, instruments, music that uh, were used for this film, such as Kaya Gum um, and percussion music, were really uh, bordering on some um, beautiful, you know, uh, productions that were made elsewhere, but perhaps South Korea. But the, the whole soundscape of the movie and uh, the quality of the sound was just truly amazing. And the same goes for those beautiful visual uh, effects that we see in the opening sequence, uh, particularly that blends so many interesting images of uh, woodblock prints. Some of them come from your collection, I noticed, uh, as well as some incorporation of oil painting. Um, so those things really popped out as is really refreshing and artistically um, satisfying. So I, my personal hope is that perhaps uh, your film will have an impact, positive impact on future productions that are coming out. Um, I would say that um, I think the film, from a little bit of what I understood from media uh, interviews that you did, is that film garnered lots of interest for the fact that it focused on humor. Um, I mean, when we think of coal mines in North Korea, I mean, first thing that probably comes to your mind is uh, labor camps. And that's how we've been so trained to associate these iconic images of tragic sites in North Korea with those uh, deep, uh, tragic events um, and life that some North Koreans, many North Koreans live. So in a way, uh, and the focus on humor was really a refreshing point. Um, but I would also mention that um, it's not the absolutely first instance of showcasing humor as a main kind of uh, emotional kind of uh, propeller to uh, drive the narratives. Um, in 1993, there was a North Korean film that kind of reminded me of uh, this film, is Urban Girl Gets Married, again featuring a romance between uh, village boy and city girl. But I think the level of romance uh, and reference to it has been really upped in this film. And I think North Koreans might have really enjoyed that aspect. Um, because I mean, this will be uh, my last comment, and then I'll give it back to you. But. Um, you know, one uh, Soviet literary critic said that in Soviet novels, boys don't fall in love with girls, they fall in love with tractors. So that's, that's mainly the uh, kind of formulaic way of uh, presenting romance as a very asexual kind of mode of interaction, whereas I think in this film we see a slightly different modality of how uh, different sexes interact with each other, and I think that might have been very uh, tantalizing as well as interesting for North Korean audiences. Yeah. Wow. Um, may, may I say something about the Romans? We really pushed very hard, as far as we could push. Uh, for We really wanted to have like a kiss at the end, but that was a little bit Pushed too far, so Come that on. didn't succeed. <laughs> we, we were told there was there has actually been a, a kiss on North Korean film, and we were we were shocked because I said never see it, and then Bjorn said, yeah, behind an umbrella, but the, the audience sort of it was meant to be led. Uh, so. so the and and the other two points, you know, the soundscaping and the animations, those are the the two things that really were done abroad, because it was the the movie was shot for the first time they shot a movie with sync sound on set. So we sent in a sound guy to teach how to record sound so that we could have the dialogues. But for it wasn't easy for the director because then he had to shut his mouth, mouth while everybody was shooting and working. But it, it was, in fact, the, the movie was finished in Belgium and we were very lucky that everybody just wanted to make that movie work. So all the tricks that can be done sound-wise, <coughs> we play them. And I think that's that's yeah, and, and that gives the movie also a level, a higher level. Because Nick told me that um, when the movie was shot, um, when the movie was shown in Pyongyang, that all the audiences were, oh, it looks so real. Mm -hmm. I never saw many other North Korean movies, but what I noticed from when I see when I saw the first one, it was like we never ever our European ears mm -hmm. would accept that kind of finishing. 
its own finishing because then it would like be yeah boring because the layers were not enough. So we treated the movie like an animation movie. We started from scratch. Everything is done. Only the dialogue we had and all the moves, the, the little sounds, all the soundscape was recreated. Would you, you can say the guy yeah, okay, That's yeah. a nice story. Yeah, we, even, uh, we got the stage where we're dealing with a, a lovely guy, Fred, who is our sound man. And uh, we, wanted, we, we all wanted a sort of an acoustic set. And then it got to the stage where the Koreans had given us acoustic music, but we were short of something. So I was sent back to Pyongyang to pick up a Kayagum, you know, sort of the Yopig. And so we dragged that back to Belgium. And, uh, and our, our sound man, Fred, mastered that very quickly. And, 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 and for the North Koreans, they, yeah, they were, as Annie said, very confused that the, uh, you know, suddenly here was a very different soundscape and something that, and they could also, uh, the other one, if you've, if I was watching Oh Youth the other day, and in North Korean films, they drop things. They either have the dialogue, but they don't have the buses in the background. They don't have these layers of sound. So suddenly they're presented with something that was visually much stronger than they've, they've had and soundscape-wise really let them into the film. For us, it was also very important that it stayed a North Korean film, that we as Europeans <coughs> or not, uh, not took it over and put our vision on it. Because I see so many, I come from Belgium, and I see so many co-productions with Holland, Belgium, France, and, and everybody had to send one actor, and at the end, there is you have a kind of a Europe pudding, we call it. So that's why we really wanted to make everything North Korea. So that's even all the instruments, all the everything is, is North Korean. There is no other music in. And so the, uh, the third director was the one who did most of the directing on set while you were in Korea and dealt with all the actors and everything else? Yeah, because we do not speak the language and it's very difficult to, uh, in a foreign language, with an interpreter sure. to, that was impossible. Yeah. So how has the reception been so far in Pyongyang? Yeah, it was at the, there is at the, the Pyongyang has like the Cannes of the East. It's the Pyongyang International Film Festival, which I know you'll all have heard of. Every two years, uh, international hasn't yet had an American film or a South Korean film, but sort of international. And we, we showed the film there. Uh, uh, so we took the players we, we, uh, from uh, some sort of the various sort of uh, stars of the North Korean cinema came and they, they enjoyed it. We had an after party. It was all, yeah, that was sort of well received. And then the first public screening was until until January um, and 2013. And, and uh, yeah, it was, well, I mean, they queued and they laughed and they asked lots of questions. And so, yeah, it was it's good. It's now been on sort of general release, but that's not the same we were talking about. It's not the same as general release in the States, it's basically one film that we gave them, one 35 mil can that gets sent around the countryside and how it works is it, it was shown in Pyongyang and 40,000 people saw it within uh, the, the first month and then the film got I think it was 13, 14 cinemas in Pyongyang and it did the rounds there, then it goes off to the countryside and there's a, there's a lovely film called um, Comrades in Dreams, and it's about projectionists. It's a, a film made by Oli Gulka. It's a documentary, and basically, it, it tells the story of how a film gets gets shown in Korea, and it gets sent to a central point, and then this woman then takes it out to the various uh, cooperative farms or wherever it may be, and they get a screening there. So the film now is doing its rounds slowly, and it's being fairly spread around the country, um, and later there'll be a, a broadcast, and that still hasn't happened, and then um, then we'll see. But yeah, it's. It's 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 getting there, and people are, people are talking about it. Whenever we go to Pyongyang, you know, people hear about it, they talk about it, and she's a star now. I mean, that's she was a star in respect that they knew the the acrobatic troupe, but as an individual, she's a star. So much so that sadly she got married last year as well. So if you <laughs> add it in. So well, do well, you, um, go ahead. Yeah, well, I was going to ask if Youngman had anything you wanted to. Yes, I'm just going on what Nick has been saying. Um, you know, I think it speaks volumes that this film that they have described as being about girl power was actually the first North Korean film to be invited to screen to South Korean audiences since 2003, and <clears throat> in 2003 the Busan International Film Festival they had been lobbying the government for ages to film North Korean uh, films. And they finally picked seven, but um, they didn't get proper permission until three days into the 10-day festival. So you can imagine that they didn't have time to organize any panels or invite the directors or any kind of seminars or anything. And um, when they did finally screen them for free, 
two of uh, two out of seven was not open to the public, and there were national intelligence uh, servants, pers people, you know, standing outside to make sure that <coughs> excuse me that. Um, non-invited guests could go in. And prior to 2003, um, I think the last North Korean film that they tried to show was on a, North, uh, on a university campus in 1991, uh, I think. So um, the fact that a film about girl power is being invited to show in South Korea says a lot, because South Korea is all about girl power right now. If we look at Girls' Generation and all the other actresses and actors, singers, and so on who are big, um, I think a film like uh, Comrade Kim Goes Flying speaks to, um, maybe we could even call it girl power diplomacy, um, because there are also reports that Hallyu is having an impact in North Korea. I don't know how true those reports are, but perhaps both regimes see a possibility there, because if we look at films like Korea, I don't know if you've seen that, about the World Table Tennis Championship. Yeah. You know, we have a young North Korean table tennis champion and a South Korean one, and you know, their cooperation is not really about table tennis or reunification. It's about you know, girl friendships. Mm. Hmm. That's an interesting point, especially when you think about like the the amount of sort of the change that you you both have most have experienced over the last. When did you first go to North Korea? Like me, uh, Nick? Yeah, me was ninety three. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, yeah. right. 20 years. Mm -hmm. The amount of change in terms of information going in and out of North Korea. Uh, I mean, I think it's actually a fairly interesting uh, way to think about it. But let, let's move on past the movie. I'm sure you guys have questions about that. I want to try and put in context how both of you got interested in North Korea in the first place. Um, so maybe, Nick, since you were the uh, slightly earlier... Yeah, and no, I, um, uh, as a landscape architect, I went to China to study Chinese landscape architecture. I was teaching at a university and a, a polytech, oh, no, university at the time uh, in England. Went over just to see the influence on Japanese landscape architecture, and of course, Korea is the filter. And then got, met a North Korean through a friend of mine, and uh, we started. He said the only way to get in is if you do travel. So we went in as tour, as tour, as a sort of tour group and liked it so much uh, that we went found it so fascinating as a landscape architect this is a you know pyongyang is a city that's that was demolished basically three buildings left standing after the korean war and so it's this sort of socialist utopia that was supposedly built um and found that interesting and then the only way to get access was to do tourism and uh, we didn't, didn't really ever plan to get into that but after 10 years of doing that we started doing cultural projects and various other pieces and started making documentaries and the first one was on a football team of 1966, North Korean football team, who beat the Italians. Soccer, sorry, for those of you who don't understand. Uh, That's and, an awesome, uh, awesome is, movie. And then made two others and a few travel things and started getting more of an, an insight into it. And then met Anya and that process literally from 2002 about, you know, we always wanted to do a project together. I don't think we either of us realized quite how, how the thing would take on, but um, that's how it all happened. So how, how, how long do you spend in uh, North Korea? Like I was there, I mean, I'm there most months. So it's, I mean, it depends if we're filming when, during the shoot. We were there for the period of the shoot. Um, yeah, so I was there. And then apart from five days, we weren't allowed to the, the coal mine. Um, but uh, but I'm, yeah, I was there last week, so I mean, I'm there every month, but sometimes for a short time, sometimes for a long time. How about you, Anya? I, I just um, went into North Korea in 2002 for the 2002 Pyongyang Film Festival just by curiosity, curiosity you say it in English like that? Um, I was at the other side, I was in Seoul with uh, my short films at the film festival and then somebody said to me there is at the other side of the border because we were visiting the DMZ, there is a film festival we just said, no, can't be true. Yes, yes, there is a film festival. And later during the karaoke, he wrote a fax number <laughs> on, on, on a piece of paper, gave it to me and said, fax, and you will be invited. So once home I did, and I had to try a lot of times, but the fax went through. And then I think three weeks later, an answer came back like, you're invited. Wow. So and then I said, oh, um, OK, <laughs> let's try to go. and. I went, and that's when I met um, met uh, Nick and and Riomiwa already. What are some of the most? I mean, this is probably an easy. You probably get this question all the time. But what are some of the most um, 
unexpected aspects of North Korean life or culture or the biggest things that we on the outside misunderstand about North Korea since you guys both have uh, you know, far more access and time there than, than almost probably anyone in this room. What are the things that we miss or the things that surprised you the most? I think your, your preconceptions are, I mean, I, although I told you for this film to put them away, I mean, we, we're very aware of our preconceptions that we get for the news and they're absolutely correct. But I think the ability that we've had is just simply time with people. Um, there's a lovely story with Ryom is that she, she came out to Beijing and a friend of ours, Vicky, who does the um, does some video for us, she worked on that f clip beforehand. She was the producer on that. And uh, she saw Ryom, and the first time she saw her, she said she knew what position she was. Ryom is a sub producer for Osung San Film Co production company. And she said, Are you in this business because it's, you know, it's a good job? And Ryom just turned around and says, I'm just mad about film. And it, it's that such a personal level that you realize that everyone we dealt with was a. I mean, I'm not a filmmaker, I've done documentaries, but this feature film was my first time. When I went on set, I was like, you know, the new boy at school and the spoiled new boy, you know, I mean, the, the, the Western boy who's, you know, he's in there, he's coming, who the hell does he think he is? He can't do anything. So for that period of time, though, that first 15 days, I was like being tested. And the tricks being played on me, there were jokes being made, but eventually you think, you know, you, you pick things up like in continuation you see that the, she's got a different hairstyle from the shot that you've had and it's meant to be a week after the film. So suddenly you're useful and suddenly you're brought in, at least this is what I think happened, you know, you're brought into the, the cohort, if you like, and you become part of that team. And it is an amazing team. I mean, the whole, the whole film crew stay in, you know, one hotel. And so every, and we watched the, you know, it was there during the, uh, the, the World Cup, the, the, t the time that they did very well against uh, Brazil. They, they lost 2-1, but it was a, sort of really was a win. But then they lost rather badly against uh, Portugal. Forget that one. Um, so I was with the crew through these sort of really quite passionate moments. And you, 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 you end up having relationships with people where they know you, they know your humour, and uh, they know you as a person. And especially if that's gone over from such a long period for me, I've, I've had friends, seen them getting married, helped a few people get married before, you know, with guides, I've seen their kids grow up, um, all sorts of things. So it, it's that, it's just basically don't forget the humanity of it. But everything else now, I mean, we, we, we're pretty well informed in the West. Anya, do you have anything that you'd like that struck you as well, for me for me it's a little bit like totally a different experience because i went to a film festival as a filmmaker and i met there two filmmakers and then it could have happened sometimes it happens at film festivals when you got to click with people uh, with nick it was his beautiful eyes with riom it was a, a wonderful character so it it was and we just kept contact and during the making of the process during the script writing and even afterwards the proudness the wanted to make a good movie we are all filmmakers, just the same. Only go for the story, the movie, for the, the North Korean director. I had the same troubles with him that I had with some Belgian directors. We didn't agree on the North, the North Korean director here wanted our main character change into a man. Yeah, of course, because he's a man. So I said, no, no possible. And then our North Korean producer is also a very strong female power, so she said, no, no way, so it's two against one. And we dressed sneak up into a shirt, so <laughs> <laughs> it was three against Ouch. one. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I think the, the most was after, when the movie was finished, for me, then, because we were all very close in an environment, I. I'm not that that I watch the news every time and I didn't know that much about what happened only what I saw in the news about North Korea but then I I worked with people there and what was my biggest frustration is that I couldn't tell that there were people living there that I, that there were filmmakers that we worked with and that was very frustrating at the moment, that everything that was you and that's also why we say in the beginning leave your preconceptions behind we didn't do that at the first, and then we saw that everybody like 25 minutes needed, like, what am I watching? And just to avoid that, we, we tried to say a few things more at the beginning of a screening, so that there is more than politics alone in North Korea. There are people living. Sure, uh, Sukyo. 
Yeah, so just taking off of that, I think um, what film shows really well is that North Koreans have sense of humor, actually a really a lively sense of humor, and that was also my personal experience um, talking to defectors who really had horrendous experience in North Korea, but they still had that amazing, sarcastic, biting sense of humor. Um, and I think um, when we think of North Korea, of course, a uh, sense of enjoyment, fun is not really the, the sensibility that come to your mind, first of all. But you know, it's just like elsewhere in any human society that it is a place where they feel a certain affinity to a community. And also, there could be some warm feelings. And you know, this uh, lively sense of humor is what keeps them really alive. And um, I think that kind of the, the importance of humor really is brought up really vividly in the film. So that's what one of the things that I really appreciate. Um, once I was interviewed by BBC about uh, this North Korean radio that they were able to listen, and it was a comic skit, uh, kind of lampooning what's going on in White House back then, and um, the journalists were saying, oh, North Koreans have sense of humor. I mean, <laughs> can it be? And yes, they do. Um, even uh, under North Korean uh, cultural history, you have certain genres of stand-up comedy called mandam, comic sketches, and also you know various types of uh, social jokes that really circulate to capture the livelihood of people. Um, and I think because of the uh, kind of, you know, 20th century unfortunate history that both Koreas lived through, through this history of con contestation, we tend to really focus on the notion of Han um, when we think of Korean cultural history. But I think it's really time to move beyond that and see broader spectrum of emotions. And I really want to advocate that maybe uh, you know, scholars in Korean studies, probably it's about time to really seriously look at the sense of hung, um, I, which I really look at it as the counterpart of Han. Hung as this uh, vivid, lively energy that's purely spent for having fun, enjoyment. And I think it really is a sentiment that lies deeper than just uh, the traumatic scratches that we felt in the 20th century um, contestation between two Koreas. So in that sense, I think the film really did a great job of capturing that and kind of bringing us deeper into that sense of enjoyment and fun. But it's also we all three wanted to make a movie that is light. And Humor is something universal. It was not easy to find a common ground of humor because there is also with cultural differences. But when we would never we come up with a cement mix competition. <laughs> but on the moment they tell you the cement mix competition and then you know that it's going to work, that it's going to be funny, that it's that is the universal humor. When when there is the um, the scene where the mother of Jiang Phil shows two pictures we were telling that we have in the West like books of people, w of women where men sometimes choose of men and try to find a way and then they come up with the idea and it looked strange and then they came up with the idea, oh man, we can use pictures, nice. So that, that was the way we did very yeah, big works and talkings and trying and explaining during the script writing process. Uh, young man, do you have anything? Yes, uh, I'd just like to kind of build on what Su was saying about the hung element. And I noticed that in the film, one of the things that really struck me that I found really appealing was the animation sequences that you had. And they seemed to correlate somehow to her emotional well being or her state, her emotional desires. And, um, you know, these uh, animation sequences, these lino cuts, you know, they here in the West, at least, um, you know, they bring to mind the propaganda images of North Korea. And yet here you appropriate them in order to, you know, bring the audience into these fantasy, a uh, non-real world. And then um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about these animation sequences and, you know, because you run a tour company, uh, I know a lot of the animation sequences have to do with landscapes and traveling. If you could talk about the connection between the two and emotions, like how you use these animation sequences to elevate audiences to this hung rather than the kind of trauma and Han. Can I just ask something? Maybe I'm a dummy, but what is the hung element? Oh, it's a sense of enjoyment, fun, um, uh, kind of almost like a, it has almost a rhythmic quality to it. Like when Koreans dance and sing, it's, it's oh, I feel hung. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, Annie is the filmmaker here, and she also has a job. She actually looks and criticizes films in production and sees where the gaps are and the mistakes. And it was very clear that when we came back after the shoot, 
the, the the story was missing a sort of emotional content. I mean, exactly what what, what you've pointed out that with Young Me we were sort of we weren't getting totally the what we wanted the the sort of depths of despair when she can't make this um, when she can't actually find she's run out of energy to go through um, the sadness and yet the joy of going back. She failed at um, when she goes back to the the mine. The, 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 what is the little vignette in there is that she's she's actually sad that she's leaving. Um, this is set in autumn scene but she's actually glad that she's you know she's conquered her affairs of heights okay she didn't get the the the, the high high trapeze but she's done enough so in a very small amount of time uh, we had these we could tell a small story behind it um, and th we we basically looked at ways we could tell us we were looking at animators all sorts of animators and then um, we looked at the anime the lino cuts again these are sort of North Korea has been making lino cuts since well, the 60s properly and sort of 50s early on very based on like a Chinese style of lino cut very heavy inked and they produce these en masse and I've got a rather a large collection of over a thousand odd pieces and so there's a lot to choose from and it was then we worked with a lovely Irish animator who who looked at these and we together Anya myself and um, Anna Marie we, we put together the stories and the emotional content that we needed and then she came up with them um, but it was fun and I don't think we we realized how beautiful it was until we then linked it with Fred and the music and and then you get that total emotional sort of little little vignette if you like that tells that emotion well let me ask one last question before we open up to the audience and get you guys involved, which is, is this going to be available on uh, Netflix, Amazon? It's in the country. In the United States? Is it available at all, or is it only showing it? So far, not yet. But, uh, are there plans to? But first, the DVD. That's what we are planning now. We did a whole first uh, film festival. So <coughs> we premiered in Toronto in 2012. And then whole 2013, beginning of 2014, we did about more than 50, 60 film festivals. And then now it's then the DVD and then it's the it's on TV. Because you we are very afraid of... You guys went to 60 films. You must be yeah, exhausted. Yeah, were, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, it was fun. I did Europe. Nick, Nick did the rest of the world. There was, there was, a, there was a lovely... What, what, going on to the Busan Film Festival, we were both there. There. And we were a bit nervous because you know this was uh, it was at the main screening. Yeah, you saw. Yeah, it was our, our second festival. We did Toronto first, and then we're at Busan. But it was our first festival in front of a Korean audience, a South Korean audience, and we we're going. Oh, this will be interesting. And then so we showed the film, and, and it was a, a bit of applause. And then this guy stood up. The first question he said, and he said, and, we, and he stood up. He said, uh, "Just like to, like you to know that uh, a South Korean." He said, he said, "It's just nice to know that that mother-in-laws in the north are the same as mother-in-laws in the south." <laughs> and when when that hit, that was such a relief. It was this idea that they'd identify with the film um, and that was that was quite a special bit of screening great well why don't we open it up to uh, the audience and we want to we want to make sure that students get a chance to ask questions yeah hi um, first of all I really enjoyed the oh, film tell us who you are just oh um, I'm James Kwan Lee I'm a production graduate student at USC um, I really enjoyed the film but I'm really curious because Anya mentioned earlier that you guys had to fight for the romance or showing, portraying romance in the film. And I'm wondering what um, post-production was like, if you had to like battle censor boards or if the government acted like a studio body or how was that like? It, I mean, the whole the whole process of us going through it wasn't it wasn't really a quick. There are limits in what you can do. Obviously, in North Korea, if you if you can't put a kiss in a film, you know you're under pretty strict limits what you can do. Um, it, it really the argument was this. this, this, this there's a lo I'll tell you a story of how the whole thing happened. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. No, you, you remember that one? There's, there's, um, this film really shouldn't have happened. Uh, we, we'd written a script with, with Anya, myself, and uh, um, uh, Riom. So the three of us had written this script. And then Riom said, right, OK, well said, we'll, we'll go ahead. We'll try and place the film. So this is basically, it's all been with filmmakers. So she, she took the film around all the studios. There's two main studios. There's April 25th studio. They said no. There's the People's Studio. They said no. Core Film Studio. And then there's even the TV studio. And they said no. So everyone said no. They said this isn't a... Korean film. It doesn't fit a North Korean trope. And um, these gang here can tell you what a North Korean trope is, but basically it has a very big political moment. There may be humor in it, but the, the main message of other North Korean films is, I think you're all very well aware, is to, it's a um, propaganda. Um, 
So this was very different, and no, no director wanted it. So this is way before any government level has got to, because um, it's just literally been written on a coffee table, partly in Belgium and partly in uh, Pyongyang. And then, uh, so that was it, end. And I told Anya, it's not happening. But then Riom, in, 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 uh, in uh, three years, was it th two, two years before we started shooting, she then, the, she then took it uh, in winter, and in winter in Pyongyang is cold, and inside is even colder. It's like being in this room. It's, it's, it's bloody freezing. And, and what Koreans do is they come in, or they leave their office, and they get warmed up at the doorman's office downstairs, you know, the guy who checks you in and checks who's coming out. And she did the first bit of North Korean market research by leaving most of the script uh, there. She had a good watch of the script and she watched people, it's a totally true story, she watched people uh, read it and she got the reactions from the doorman, which is in a way why the doorman in our film is, is such an important character. And he said people like this film, they like this story, they want to know what goes on. And there was one girl in particular who Rom interviewed and she said okay and she, she empowered, went again to try. And again everyone said no, uh, even the TV um, studio. So she's, she's, a, she's a real tough nut, this girl. And she went back again to the April 25th studio, this military studio, and, and spoke to the director there who she knew because they come, at the some time there's change, they become under the Ministry of Culture. And she met this chap who gave her an audition and said, OK, well, you seem to be very keen. And, and like in the film, she says, you don't take no for an answer. Let me introduce you to someone. And her father was a cinematographer and had worked with a, a, a director, and his son was the director, and his his son is Kim Kim Kwang, our director. So there's another massive coincidence. He said, well, look, our parents work together. I'll take it on. And without that, it wouldn't have happened. Now, finally, I get the romance. We were then left with a director whose basic movies beforehand were war movies. Not probably the best guy to make a romantic movie with. So that's where the pushing came in. That's where the push. It wasn't a, conf it wasn't a confrontation with, uh, with the system. It was a confrontation with him. Would you you'd agree? Yeah. yeah, it's true. Because normally with a romantic comedy, you have boy meets girl, and then there is all kind of struggle, and there is another boy or another girl comes in, and at the end, it's the one you didn't expect they got married. But then you need three characters. But we only could have two characters. But there is nothing as boring as that you know from the first moment, oh, those two are going to be. So... It, it, it was finding a way that it was not too, too obvious, but obvious enough and because there was like no hand holding and, and no kissing, we t it was all kind of yeah, had to solve solutions during script writing, but most of the time were done in post-production. Thanks. Um, so my name is Julian. I'm working with Liberty North Korea, a nonprofit here in town. And I just wanted to ask, um, I'm sure you've gotten criticism before, and I'm just wondering how do you address um, like the balance between knowing that there are so many you know, things that you could show about North Korea that are not shown in this film, and that people are going to be watching it and maybe wondering, oh, is this what life is really like? Um, you're not always here to kind of preface it at the beginning of the film. I'm just wondering, how do you balance that, and where do you really draw that line of this is an ethical situation I'm not going to I'm not going to cross into? I'm not sure re really understand very well the question, but I think for me it's very simple. We made a fiction movie, and it was a fiction movie made for the North Korean audiences. All the documentaries are made for people outside North Korea. So, yeah, there was like writing during the script making, during the movie making, there was for me no, no balance. Only just finding a way like, okay, this is our audience would understand, and this is their audience would understand. I think um, the question seems to be whether there's a problem with the film representing a North Korea that's actually not as familiar to the West, right? Something that caters to them. And I think we could say the same about a lot of South Korean productions as well. A lot of those films and dramas that exhibit a very extravagant kind of lifestyle and um, you know spaces and places in the city and so on, those are very carefully selected, but it's not necessarily um, all real like not a lot of people live like that and a lot of them are sets and but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not relevant to understanding how South Korea is today and the kind of desires that um, create that kind of imaginary of what people think and want and so on and in Comrade Kim you know in the beginning and the end they say um, 
they talk about dreams. And if you have a film that's not exactly real, it could still be about dreams. And you know, perhaps these dreams are something about the North Koreans as people that the film introduces that can be understood as kind of real as well, if that makes any sense. Well, for me, movies are like escapism. Um, so they don't need to be real. The beautiful they are, the better they are, and the more I enjoy it, watching it and making it. So for me, when I see Bruce Willis rescuing the world, yeah. I just go for one hour and a half into the story. And that's it. <laughs> that's I don't not real? That's the re yeah, no, <laughs> they told me it's not real. But for one, one hour and a half, I would really believe that it's real. And then I can go in and... That for me, it's the same. I think it's been interesting also just how the film's been picked up. I mean, again, the intention was to uh, give a North Korean audience something that they haven't had before. That was so, uh, something different, something new. Um, but at the same time, I think with our film, what, what really gave me great satisfaction was for the film to be shown in, in Busan. It's also shown at you know, various human rights festivals and things. So there's been a use for it. It's been valued whether that's showing people an intimacy uh, through the film that you know there's individuals there and characters. But you're absolutely right. I mean, I think it's it's a difficult one, and people have very very views one side or the other. I happen to believe in engagement and and so this sort of fitted my sort of feeling with it. I worked with Anya because it was a film, I knew she was a great filmmaker, and we could make something that 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 hopefully would have a value out there. And I, I don't know, I think we'll have to come back in, in, in time and see if it has had an impact. It's had a small impact now, but it, again, we talked about where it's been seen. In North Korea, it'll be seen, uh, it'll be, you know, a box office hit because there ain't many films being accepted there at the moment. But I would like it to get wider distribution here. I, I don't think for any minute that if you watch this film that you're going to go and leave, the, leave screaming out here saying I must affect North Korea. I don't think it's that sort of film. <laughs> Yeah, where, where we went, I mean, the locations are all real. There's no sort of fake locations. So the Steelworks factory is a Steelworks factory. You know, the real sets were pretty basic stuff. I mean, there's the, the circus we obviously had to have. Um, and then everything else was pretty much, you know, normal sort of st street life. Hi, I'm Sunghae, and I'm actually a public policy urban planning student. And I was wondering if I can ask um, more in a political question. Is that okay? Um, not film related? Get out. No. <laughs> Security. No, no, no. Um, you you can ask. We, we will, some of us are much more happy to talk about that than others, awesome. being a political science professor. <laughs> so go ahead, sure. So I want to ask um, a little bit more about reunification and the relationship between China and North Korea. So um, if I s say North Korea falls, um, how much say does South Korea have over that, considering that China China um, has um, a lot of interest in the North Korea border and let me let me yeah. put it this way. I think that's a great question. <laughs> it's what I spend most of my time thinking about. Mm -hmm. So I don't I really don't just like these political questions, they, they should be asked, right? Um, that's probably a little off topic for uh -huh. this yeah. um, because it's so much not about say movies or okay. film or anything else. So I don't mean to cut you off at all because right, that's right. That I have a book coming out about unification, <laughs> but this is probably not the. Okay. So how much you know? That's not. That's just yeah, not yeah, what that, they do, right? That's why yeah. I studied <laughs> filmmaking. Is <laughs> okay, but we can talk another yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, Take one of my classes. Let's give it to Professor Park first. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, it's great to see you, Nick. I still remember the movie experience of watching Daniel Gordon's first film and his New York premiere. And what always surprised me about his film is how. It's so bright and colorful and nothing like the secret camera documentary of North Korea. But at the same time, there's this subversive image, uh, subversive messages that not only from, you know, like this conformist message from North Korea, but uh, they can create a layered interpretation, not just for us, but for also North Korean audience. And in relation to that, watching this film also made me think about um, how the narrative converges and diverges from the normative, narrative norms in North Korea. And so I have a particular question about the details of two, uh, two parts of the manuscript, uh, uh, transcript. The first is, there is this generous message, right? There's a one, one line in the movie that a general advice instructed us to do this, right? But normally, it comes in the climax, and that kind of settles uh, the issue. But here, the girl's difficulty 
is overcome only after the father and the working class communities uh, come to support her at the theater. So I wonder what kind of negotiation you had, right, in uh, writing that line, the obligatory line, the lip service to general, but kind of sidelining it at the same time. Another thing is about this follow your dream. Uh, to me, what uh, the, this narrative departs most from the normative narrative because of that, uh, particularly in that ending, because follow your dream, which is very individualist message, is not something that I've, I've seen, I'm used to seeing in uh, North Korean cultural products. So that line, I suppose, came from you, and I don't know like how North Korean responded, and I'd be curious if you could uh, answer, explain more about that. Well, you do the first one. Um, I do the I second one. <laughs> But the follow your dream is, is just a universal message. This is a co-production between three countries. And, and I'm pretty much used to do messages to say to at the end, in the end credits. And here it is just like, wherever you, it starts from the beginning, like wherever, it's, it's one, one big line, wherever you all, we all have dreams. And this is just one of it. So I was brought up, my grandmother always told me like, if you really believe in something, go for it don't give up and one day you will achieve and that's also we spent seven years on making the movie everybody said to me that's not possible you're never going to achieve there will never be a movie but I don't want to give up that easily. And there is also a, 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 an, um, what is it, a sentence in a saying in Korea that you have to follow um, what is the nothing is impossible. Which is also something like, yeah, it's, it's for me, it's universal. Follow your dreams. So and, and that's Korean my message for all of you. If you have a dream, go for it. It could be the first North Korean film with product placement, literally, Koryo yeah. Hangong yeah. and your own company. Because <laughs> you, you enter the film with this, an eye of a tourist. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> No, I think that's, uh, we want you guys to help interpret it. I know it's coming from we'll the, back there. In, in this country, the number of female minors is of 150,000, 150, is 150 generous estimates who have largely won it as fighting tooth and nail for equality and fruity coal mine employment project. I noticed in the coal mining scene that there was a, reasonable nu number of women that were just simply part of the workforce and nothing more. Ditto for the construction site. It, was that actually representative of the Korean workforce? The second question, of course, relates directly to film. In the Korean film schools and of the Korean uh, positions in Create creative and authoritative. How many of them, or percentage-wise or otherwise, are women? And are they, and if it's insufficient, are they making moves to change that? Great questions. The, the, one of the reasons we wanted to make a film about a girl is simply because of that very issue. The, there aren't female directors, uh, um, and Ryong Mi Hwa was our. This woman was our. Uh, if you like, she was Young Mi in the film. We chose her because we identified with her. Anya and I did, and. I think the situation for women in, in, in the North is, is, is not particularly brilliant. I, I think there's other areas in Asia, and I'll let these two who know much more than I do. But that was the one reason why we decided, yeah, girl power, let's, let's go for it. We did not want to make a film, uh, the, the initial film that the director said, of another man you know, achieving glory. That's, that's enough of that. Okay, uh, my name's Eunhae, I'm from Biola. I just want to say I really appreciate this film because it doesn't just show North Korea's suffering and all this disparity, but you're showing that North Korea has humor, it has young love. And that being said, with I just wanted to know your thoughts about the North Korean film releasing in December starring James Franco called The Interview. He is making a satire about North Korea, poking fun at it. What do you think the effects will be for the film industry with North Korea, do you think North Korea is going to have be more hostile for more collaborative work? Anyone? Mm. No, I, I mean they, they're not. I mean, the, 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 it'll get known. There'll be a, a, a certain amount in government who will know, what, but no one in North Korea will know about that. Oh, they, right. they, they just won't know. They don't hear. There's no in, internet. There's no. I mean, for the general person, I mean, they've got mobile phones, but it's 
within their community it's not outside there's an intranet which is very much inside they won't see this film they just it's so it won't matter it'll be you'll hear the the sort of furore coming from the other side you'll hear um, um kcna the the north korean uh, voice of, of of north korea you know damning this and what have you but for the north korean public won't know about it so you go so I feel like whether you like the film or not, I think it's pretty significant in terms of North Korean cinema history that there was this co-production, right? I mean, it's very unusual opportunity for people to really engage on kind of different register other than all these politicized fights and whatnot. And um, since you mentioned co-production, actually North Korea actually collaborated with US filmmakers and they released a film called The Other Side of the Mountain um, about a romance between South Korean and North Korean uh, soldiers during the war. Um, and it's, I think, currently traveling through the uh, small film circuit. So um, I, it's my personal wish that the co-production model will continue on. I'll, I'll make one small point, just because so, I want to say again, we don't have to avoid politics here. It's just they don't necessarily talk about it much, right? I'll, I'll point one thing out that I found very interesting about Kim Jong Un and the response to the whole Franco and the Rodman kind of things, because he came out criticized it and things like that, which is we tend to think that North Korea leadership only cares about you know, bribery or wealth or, or nuclear weapons, um, but it's very clear that they are very aware of how their status is on the international stage as well. And that this is something that is personally offensive to the leadership for how they're being portrayed. I mean, they care about their status and what other countries think about them and how they treat them. I think as much as they care about how much money they have and how many nuclear weapons they have. And the response to some dumb movie that's probably, you know, I have no idea what it's going to be like, but it's just a movie, shows how aware the North Korean leadership is of its place in the world. Hi. Um, Maybe we'll, okay. You Go mentioned uh, North Korean to... audiences uh, several times, and I'm wondering uh, if you know what you're referring to when you call when you talk about North Korean audiences. I mean, does average Young Hee and Chelsea, you know, average Joe, have uh, access to this kind of movie? Do they have time and money, you know, resources to to go see these movies? Yeah, and North Korea film at the moment, um, just to give you sort of some other ideas, this film has been going around the country, so I haven't got the numbers going around. I will get those, but in Pyongyang, it was 40,000. So that's Pyongyang, relatively privileged people. They've seen it, and I have know, I know that it's been down in Kaesong, and it's been seen there. And normally what happens, again, it's really shown in this documentary, is, is it's shown at a cinema, it's on for a night, uh, maybe two nights, and then people either go as a work unit, they're given, or they pay to go and see it. It. So that's up to them. But very often, uh, especially in Pyongyang, you, you pay a cinema ticket. Um, there's, there's projects going on in North Korea at the moment for, uh, they do TV series, like soap series, of about six or seven parts. And people, are, they, they, these are then being turned into um, uh, uh, onto DVD. And they're being bought. They're under a dollar each, but they are being bought. You know, sort of 50, 60,000 people buying them. So the people are interested in film. People want to buy it on DVD because if there's electricity shortages they can then get to see the film at a time you know if, if the if the power's out it doesn't mean they're going to miss it as on in tv um but the whole thing is changing the whole spectrum with with entertainment is changing chinese films now are coming in chinese tv series uh, are coming into north korea and being shown admittedly there's limited regions where they're going to our film i see absolutely no reason why it would be not be seen throughout the whole country and i'm sure when it's broadcast much as when they broadcast uh, Bend It Like Beckham, we managed to get that film shown uh, and broadcast. That was broadcast throughout the whole of the country. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, I, I just have three quick questions. Uh, the first one, perhaps you could answer uh, very quickly. Uh, you said that uh, the sound system was um, the voice syncing. Uh, I thought I noticed some of the outdoor scenes uh, in which they were doing, uh, the, it wasn't matched. So is that is that the case, that some of the outdoor scenes, uh, the, the, the voice did not automatically get recorded and put into the f into the film uh, no 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 it was all recorded but not necessarily on the same time we only oh. had three days to um, learn so it's very technical but the the sound guy sometimes took the actors apart and say say it again because okay. he didn't know how to handle or reach you without going into the image okay okay the, um this Thank you. Uh, the second question has to do with the subversive <laughs> message. That's really fun, I think. Um, some things I noticed uh, in the background was where the, were the uh, propaganda messages. Uh, did you?
take those into account? I mean, was that part of the negotiations of what, what was left? Some of it has to do with, you know, the Kim Jong-il era that had... No, that's them. That's the scene. That's their film reality. So everything there, you know, is set up for that and is there for a purpose. Okay. That's their decision. I see. Uh, the third is uh, a bit broader and more serious. Well, um, you said that this is a movie that you made for a North Korean audience. It's a North Korean movie for a North Korean audience. And so I'm wondering uh, whether you as foreign filmmakers, uh, and you said you don't speak the language, uh, you, what do you think you contribute? Uh, what is it that you bring to this effort as uh, these people who are from outside of North Korea, outside of North Korean culture? Uh, and the flip side, the question is, um, because this is a film released in North Korea, there, uh, there has to be a political element in, uh, in this. Uh, someone at the Ministry of Culture, or maybe even higher up, has to approve the content ultimately, right? And so what do you think, or what did you think the North Korean regime, uh, whatever that might be, what do you think they got out of this? I think, again, uh, to answer that question, we, I mean, we, we're in the dark as you were. We, this is a film that uh, it goes back to that story with Rom. It was a film that shouldn't have been made because initially they said, this, you know, we will, not, we will not take this. Somewhere along the line, when Rom said, and she, she took it to the, she found a director who was willing to take this film on. And, and that really was, you know, the film was gone. It wasn't going to happen. She then found this director. Then somewhere along the line, between that moment and that film then getting permission to be shot, something happened. So whether we hit, hit it right, where the leadership said, OK, we're prepared to make something like this uh, for entertainment's sake, or it actually does have you know, value, I don't know. I mean, we don't know. We can, and we all have our own opinions on that one. But it happened. But it was, it, I don't, it wasn't a decision, like it wasn't, it didn't come from the government saying, right, what message can we deliver with this film? It's actually, the, because the first time they saw the film was when we delivered it to them after post-production. So they had no input from the script. All they had was the script. And then that script got altered and changed and tripped. And, you know, when you make a film, you sw swap around. So they had no idea what happened. They ended up with, you know, being presented a finished film for the festival a few weeks i think it was a, just a few weeks before the festival how they how they can sell that i don't know whether they do sell that as propaganda whether they sell it as an entertainment movie i'm not sure i know the reaction of the people there is people go in there and laugh and one woman said to me a north korean woman because i spoke to quite a few people afterwards uh, he said it's just like color and light coming flooding in she didn't come in and say well i've got a renewed vigor for you know the, the song and policy this that the, that was not in it she and the most the most the girls say he's pretty hungry one of the things that we really when we decided to make the film we the waitresses in the restaurant we working when we were writing this they said can you put some young people in we're so fed up with old people yeah. in our films we want some sexy people and so i think actually sorry to sort of bring it down to basic level but we managed to do that there was another part of the question which i don't think i, I obviously cleverly avoided what do you bring what do we bring? I don't know. I I, I, I wanted to make some, I, I, on a personal level, it was a very personal thing. I wanted to be involved. I'd seen the reaction of, of um, I've seen a lot of North Korean films. I've been in North Korean cinemas with North Koreans. And I'd seen the different, and I've, okay, films like Oh Youth, there's, there's lovely elements in that that make people laugh, for example. And The Story of a Basketball, there's great, lovely directors who do have a lot of humour in films. And we can talk about that. But when I saw something like Bend It Like Beckham come in and really seeing an audience, and we also took Mr Bean uh, for the film festival, I thought maybe we can do, you know, up the level a bit. I don't know what you're... Yeah, for me it was just uh, the creation together with totally filmmakers from another culture. I really was curious how it was going to be and how we were going to achieve to find a common story. And and that was really what, what not... It's not easy. It's not easy to make a movie in their own culture. Like, m not easy to make a movie with a totally other culture. You do not speak the language at all. I learned five words Korean in the meantime. It took me ten years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't, from my point of view, I don't see it so much as a romance, as uh, another type of universal theme of striving for excellence 
in a field where there's very little room to break through. And I think that anybody in any country can understand this. I think that it could be trying to be the best chess player in Russia, or trying to be the best abstract mathematician at MIT, or trying to be uh, the next LeBron James. There's very little room to break through, and it's a huge achievement if you ever manage to do it. So I think it can be understand understood worldwide. And as you, um, he mentioned, what do you bring? You can certainly bring distribution. And as you begin to look for your distribution, I think the temptation is to roll it out in uh, metropolitan areas where you think an audience can understand or is open to, to this. But uh, don't sell yourself short. Um, again, it's universal. Um, in, in the United States, there are small communities, like anybody who ever grew up listening to country music knows that Loretta Lynn or glamour girls like Dolly Parton grew up in these kind of families and that they were probably discouraged from becoming what they became and they made it out anyhow. And anybody in South Africa can understand what it is to uh, work in a dangerous field and maybe dream of whether it's mining or whether it's industry that's not properly protected by the right you know safety rules uh, where you're in danger all the time and you're and your multiple generations of the same type of labor can understand what it would be to strive to be a singer or something impossible so as you're looking for distribution um, try to believe that many people will be able to understand the film. Um, and um, why, I'll put a question at the end of it just to make it a question. Um, why did you believe that it would be difficult for a non-North Korean to be able to uh, identify with or understand the film? Okay, um, my name is Rish, and my question is, uh, as directors who don't speak the language of the movie, uh, how do you manage the best performance out of your actors, and how do you actually direct the Korean actors? Okay, and then we'll go take one more right next to him, and then we'll come down here for you guys, then we'll go over there. Um, just out of curiosity, uh, I was wondering what the uh, funding climate is like in North Korea, and how does that generally affect the work that is produced there, as well as like the work that you had? especially since it was a co-production, like how is that different and how does it affect it? Now we'll turn it over to you guys. But my memory is still a little bit jet lagged, so I go straight to the last one. Um, the co-production were three countries, and, and in fact, everybody paid, pay, uh, paid their own part in it. So that was it. It was really very simple, all private money involved. It was all very simple. So the North Koreans paid for their cars, their crew, their, their food, their everything. Do you want to talk about directing them? Oh, yeah, that other question, yeah, yeah, I didn't, sorry, I didn't remember. Um, we were with three directors, but um, the, the North Korean ag uh, director, he was on set all the time, so he was the one who made the story from paper into the acting and, and the real. We, we came back afterwards in editing. And on, on this one, they said the little story, the, the, what was interesting, after we f made the film, I actually asked Han Jung Sim, uh, the, the, the lead actress, her story. And her story is that her mum had been in Pyongyang, but they were living outside Pyongyang, about 40 kilometers outside Pyongyang. Her sister, her mum had always wanted to be in a circus, okay. so she sent her elder sister to try and become a, um, a, a circus star, and she was 15 years old and failed. And then Han Jung, so uh, she didn't make it, and then Han Jung Sim went went at a younger age to try and get in the circus at about 10 years old and failed twice and eventually was taken on. So in a funny way, there's a little bit of a, a story of a girl. And you, you know, you can imagine the, you know, this is a girl who shouldn't have been in the circus uh, actually got there in the end. So there's a little bit of truth in, uh, in the story itself. It's quite a nice story. She wasn't born into the circus, if you like. Um, so while watching the film, I personally felt that it was very interesting to see that the circus troupe and the construction workers were very supportive of the main character um, joining the circus. But like normally, um, 
such a large group of people wouldn't be that supportive, I would think. But like, I, w I was wondering if that's because um, circus is such a big deal in North Korea, or if it's because like, is it like a special characteristic of North Korean communities, like from your observations? Okay, great. And then a uh, gentleman over on the right side. Just like in the, after the Russian Revolution, I was wondering, after the Re Revolution of the two Koreas, was there a pre-existing, um, I was going to say, cinema archival thing that went on? I mean, was there filmmaking during before? Did they actually make films before the revolution? I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, everybody, the beginning of the 20th century seemed to be making films, and I was just wondering if North Korea or Korea at that time was making films before the, the revolution broke out. Yeah, they have, um, before Korea was divided, there was a burgeoning cinema industry uh, in the early 20th century. Um, a lot of the films are lost. Many have been found again uh, in recent years, around 2006. Um, and they arrange, um, there are quite a few of them, especially in the 1920s and 1930s. Um, and they range from propaganda to entertainment, very well made. And then the cinema industry splits you know, after the Korean War, of course. If, if you've been to Pyongyang, everything is communal. Yeah. Everything, mass dance to, you know, it's how actually people meet their, their the sort of young students stuff, and that's, that's an excuse for them to meet people. Um, the, it, it, it's mass everything. I mean, you just do things en masse. So it's, it's funny, because I didn't think about it, but it, it may be surprising. That I think the idea of when we wrote the script is they come because it's her, because she's such a cool character that people just get behind her, and she becomes this sort of, you know, they identify with her as this is, this is a girl who can go places, let's support her. And you know it, that fits in with Korean tropes, like one, you know, Korean tropes, and also uh, the Three Musketeers, which is a saying, you know, one for all, all for one. It's a very uh, big North Korean saying that they have. Um, so it all sort of fits in in a, in a way. But in the film sense, we wanted that sort of. You know, wow! It's like that Rocky moment where all the kids come, you know, running around. We love that sort of idea of yeah, everyone will support her. it. It was just came out that way naturally. Well, I want to thank particularly you guys for coming, uh, Sue Young for coming all the way down from Santa Barbara, Youngman, and all of you for uh, coming to both the film festival and the um, uh, panel discussion. I want to also invite all of you who can hear me over to the On House, which is the Korean Studies Institute. We're having a reception, so it's just down the street towards the JEP House. So I, ho I do hope you join us, and that way you can continue to push them more on the political meaning of their uh, movie. <laughs> Thanks so much.